Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. Why, thank you very much there, uh, Uncle Ken. Thank you very much for that introduction. And look, guys, welcome to another one of our Reading with Uncle Ken podcasts. Today, we're actually on part 31. And if you recall from last week, if uh, you listened to our podcast from last week, and thank you very much, guys, we're getting on average around about 400 views for our Reading with Uncle Ken. That's probably more books than he sold in 10 years, I would say. But thank you so much for coming to our channel and listening to our podcast. At the moment, we're on chapter 11, uh, entitled The Villains. And in essence, what Ken Kratz is talking about are both Sergeant Andrew Colburn and Lieutenant James Lank. Now, as you know, both of them played uh, major roles um, in the uh, investigation, especially at the Avery Salvage Yard. And we'll also learn that um, Colburn was also at Cuss Road. And uh, what I'll do um, after, uh, after the, our introductions, I actually went through all of Queso um, and I've highlighted all the things that Colburn has done uh, during the investigation um, when law enforcement were at the Avery Salvage Yard. Um, just to bring everybody up to speed, and uh, you'll be surprised um, how Colburn and, to a lesser degree, uh, Link, they were basically everywhere. Well, look, guys, if you like what we do, please subscribe to our channel. And I've noticed that we've obtained more subscriptions. I think we have 1,590 subscribers, which is fantastic. And uh, thank you guys for being so loyal and for rolling up when you can. Uh, I know for some of you it's very early in the morning uh, and if you live in uh, this part of the world in Australia it's late at night but hey um, we try our very best. So thank you guys for your support. If you like what we do uh, please give us a thumbs up. If you have any suggestions don't hesitate. Write down your questions in chat and we'll try and go through them as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, the Foul Play team would like to give a shout out to Jeff Jones. Uh, he was a recipient of the Richard McAdam Advocacy Foundation Award, and Jeff started his own YouTube channel. And uh, one of the guests that he had was the actual founder of the MVAC system. Uh, and he interviewed the uh, person who came up with the system. And if you've got any time, really check it out. A really good interview. And you can tell that uh, Jeff is very, very passionate um, about, you know, the cases and also the importance of that technology. And, uh, you know, one thinks how important uh, Kathleen Zellner's experts um, would be or would have if they had the MVAC system as well as the forensic evidence. For example, the RAV4, the number plates, um, even the key. It'll be awesome to find out exactly what DNA samples are present on those pieces of forensic evidence. Truly remarkable. And guys, before we start the podcast proper, I know that we have a lot of passionate people in chat, which is fantastic, but please be respectful in chat, okay? Uh, we're all here for a common cause. We're here to learn the truth, right? Wherever the chips may fall, we're here to learn the truth, and uh, we can hopefully be respectful for each other. Well, look, welcome, guys. My name is Dr. Silkman, and I'm from the Foul Play team. And I'd like to introduce our guests, our guest panel. And what I'll do, I'll get them to read, uh, say their name, who they are. So you guys in the chat, especially if you're new, um, can get to know our voices. First of all, we have Alice. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We have Bibi. Hey, everyone. We have Checking Convictions. 
Hello. Good morning. We have inexplicable Susan. Good morning, everybody. We have Jack61. Hello, hello. Thanks for joining us. We have Zoe. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Far Play. And we have Sammy. Howdy. So, uh, guys, checking convictions uh, and like and Sammy as well will be monitoring the chat. So if you guys got any questions, write them down and we'll try and answer your questions during the podcast. Now, what we'll do, guys, we'll make a start on the podcast proper. But before we do, don't forget that we have a, a very extensive YouTube channel where we cover a, a lot of aspects of both the Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery cases. We also have looked at other cases as well. We, of course, have Reading with Uncle Ken series, and we also have an excellent open mic uh, session as well, podcast, whereby uh, Jack runs the session and he has uh, a lot of very interesting guests and they cover a lot of topics, which is awesome. And you'll find that on our YouTube channel. Uh, we also have a very extensive website and that's simply brilliant. And what you find on the website are a lot of documents, uh, videos, um, anything to do with the trial, both the 1985 trial and the 2005 trials of Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery, there's a lot of documents and a lot of people have worked very hard uh, to obtain foyers. Uh, for example, Jack 61, Sunshine Christina, and I think also Mystic Jinx, and quite a few of our researchers uh, have obtained foyers and Zoe's been really good and uploading them to the website. Hey, those documents are free for you to have a read and do your research. Uh, any money that we make from the channel, uh, we use it to get documents. So you guys don't have to pay. And uh, the other thing is, is that uh, I believe Jack61 uh, obtained some phone calls. Uh, Jack61, you wanna make a quick comment on those calls? Uh, yeah, recently the the new newly uploaded calls were um, there were calls that we've many have attempted to get from uh, Calumet County, and they're these are part of what Sheriff Weigert has deemed as sealed evidence, sealed with evidence tape, and he refused to break the seal. So um, me and my big mouth decided to <laughs> request it from Manitowoc. From uh, yes, and uh, I got them. You know, it, it wasn't exactly. Specifically, what I requested, but it still it still covered what we what we needed. So, yeah, we were very fortunate. Yep, and uh, so we got those and the ones the calls that we didn't have, we got them uploaded. There were several, so those were very interesting. Awesome. Did the um, phone calls between Jody and uh, Stephen when Jody yep. was in prison? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've listened to them. Very, very interesting. And of course, don't forget, guys. Ken Kratz also listened to those calls as well, and he even wrote it in his book. Uh, he made sure that he listened to all the calls, or he had people listen to the calls and give him a summary. So he he was fully uh, briefed on what was going on, right? And that's why um, uh, Ken Kratz had to call Stephen Avery the multitasking killer, because somehow in between the phone calls and everything else he was doing, he was obviously raping, killing, mutilating, and uh, cremating Teresa Horbach, according to Ken Kratz. So, guys, we have <laughs> Jack 61. You want to make a comment on that one? Well, I just think it's really interesting. You know, if you listen to some of these calls, uh, you know, especially on November 4th, you could literally tell. Yeah. We talked about it you know, the other day. You could tell Stevens, like, this girl's missing. And, and he, you know, he'd just seen her, you know, just a few days prior. He'd seen her in, on other occasions. And you could tell in his voice he wasn't faking that. There's just no way, not a chance. Correct. And Correct. one last thing, um, Christina woke up and joined us. Hi, Christina. Oh, awesome, awesome. Uh, Sunshine, Christina, you want to introduce yourself? Sunshine, Christina, are you there? 
<laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Are you getting a morning coffee? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm be done in just a minute. I literally woke up, saw the time, and jumped on here. So. Right. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. And uh, uh, allegedly, uh, Neverly won't be joining us because where's Neverly gone? Does anyone know where Neverly is? She Vegas. had a wedding in Vegas. <laughs> Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, Doc. That's all I got. It, well, what poor excuse is that? You know, reading with Uncle Ken or or going to Las Vegas? <laughs> I don't know. What's the matter with these guys? I don't know. Anyway, guys, it's good to be here. What we're going to do is we're going to start the podcast proper. Uh, today's podcast likely will go for an hour. Uh, uh, my aim is to finish off this chapter. I don't want to start the new chapter because the new chapter is on Ken Kratz himself uh, entitled The Prize. So I want to devote enough quality time for that and not rush it. So Ken Kratz, in this chapter, uh, writes about Colburn and Link and the mere fact of that um, both of them were very, very hard done by. They were treated very harshly by the defense. And let me tell you that Ken Kratz was very, very upset. Not only Ken Kratz, but Fallon and Garn, they were furious with the defense because the defense came up with the suggestion that both Link and Colburn were involved in planting evidence. So, what I've done here, a lot of people may or may not know this, um, but what I've done is I've gone through all of CASO and I've worked out and pointed out exactly what Colburn did when he was um, doing his investigation at the salvage yard. And I'm going to summarize this and then I'll stop and get people's opinions because um, some people may not know what Colburn was up to. So we'll make a start. Now, on the 3rd of November 2005, Teresa Horbach was reported missing by her mother, Karen. Mark Wiegert, who turned out to be a lead investigator in this case, he phones Colburn. Colburn then goes to the Avery Salvage Yard and he speaks with Stephen Avery. Colburn later went to go and see George Zipperer. And uh, George Zipperer, um, it was very hard to get access to him. He was very non-compliant uh, and very, very grumpy, and he also threatened the police. Stephen Avery was very accommodating, uh, did all the requests that were asked of him, and I believe that Colburn uh, went in the trailer and had a quick look. On the 5th of November, Colburn, and now remember the 5th of November is when they find the RAV4 on the Avery Salvage Yard. Colburn photographed inside Stephen Avery's residence. He searched Stephen Avery's bedroom and other rooms in the trailer. He had collected bedding and other evidence. And he also noticed bloodstains. There were bloodstains on the floor. There were bloodstains around um, a wooden frame of the door. Colburn also removed the vacuum cleaner bag, duct tape, pillows from a couch, and fiber on a carpet. On the 6th of November, Colburn searched Stephen Avery's garage, Charles Avery's trailer. He collected two guns in Stephen Avery's bedroom, and he also searched Stephen Avery's Ford F-350. And what's interesting, if you have a look at the photographs of the Ford F-350, there appears to be blood droplets on the carpet inside the car. Also on the 6th of November, Colburn went to Maribel Caves Park, got a call, 
and um, a searcher found blue jeans and also a lube box. So you can see that Colburn not only stayed at the salvage yard, he went to other locations as well. On the 7th of November, Colburn opened up trunks of the vehicles on the Avery salvage yard. He actually used the crowbar. He went inside Bob uh, Yonder's residence and he took the firearms. He also checked several outbuildings on the Avery salvage yard as well. He took then he took details about Stephen Avery's computer. And this is interesting. He was called to go to Cuss Road. Then he came back to the Avery salvage yard. And later that afternoon, he was called back to Cuss Road. Now, believe it or not, he said that he helped dig the area of the disturbed dirt. And if you remember from the trial transcript, Colburn said, no, it was nothing, turned out to be nothing. So it's interesting that Colburn visited the Cuss Road burial site twice. On the 8th of November, Colburn, with others, they find the key in Stephen Avery's bedroom. And that key turned out to be the Toyota RAV4 spare key. And as we all know, it happened to have Stephen Avery's DNA on the key. Teresa's Horbach's DNA or no one else's DNA was present on the key, only Stephen Avery's. He then searched Stephen Avery's garage for a wrench type tool, because remember, they were suspicious that this particular type of uh, tool uh, used maybe to change a tire uh, was missing. So they were looking for this particular tool in Stephen Avery's garage. On the 9th of November, he searched the office at the Avery salvage yard. He also searched Stephen Avery's bedroom and he was looking for a garage door opener as well as women's gloves. He collected and photographed evidence. He again searched Stephen Avery's garage. He searched the burn pit and collected items and he photographed them. On the same day, he went into Barb's residence and opened safes looking for evidence. And believe it or not, he even went into Brendan, uh, sorry, Bobby Dassey's bedroom and found 0.22 rounds in the safe, in his safe. At 2.50 that afternoon, he photographed an audio vox phone that was found by John Campion, and this was found on the side of the road at Ridge Road on South 147. So it's pretty obvious that... Um, Colburn was absolutely everywhere, right? And he also found a lot of the evidence that would be used against Stephen. Now, remember, uh, Colburn is from the, was from the MTSO, and there were strict instructions that uh, due to a conflict of interest, and he also, also deposed, that um, MTSO officers weren't meant to be on the Avery salvage yard. Now, what you notice here, it's pretty obvious that Colburn was absolutely everywhere. He writes a very small report on the 29th of June, right? So with all the things he did, he only wrote a very small report and that was it. Now, guys, does anyone have any comments about that, about our good friend, Colburn? Do we have any comments? Jack61. I think it's quite amazing, considering what we know and how many emails he wrote really beginning at the first, you know, within two weeks of ma'am airing him trying to get a lawyer and how many emails and how detailed and, and long they were, how little 
reporting he actually did as far as police reports handed in, the comparison is not even close. Correct, correct. Um, now, <laughs> what is interesting here is that uh, both Lenk and Colburn gave the excuse because they were asked, well, you know, you, you have been doing all these activities on the salvage yard, yet you wrote very little. And their answers were, well, uh, our supervisors from Calumet, they were responsible for writing the reports. So <laughs> instead of the actual person, Colburn and Link, writing down the reports of what they did, they relied on their so-called supervisors to write their reports for them. Check 61. See, and I think that's just, um, it just gives them an out to really do whatever they want. And how many other officers that, it, that, that were accompanied or, or assisted, like from MTSCO, like Jacobs and you know, so many others that Jacobs didn't write a single thing. And he was everywhere. He did all kinds of stuff. Okay. Correct. And he, Correct. He, didn't, he didn't write anything. It's just Correct. It's, it's terrible. And if you notice, there's no report about him calling in the plates either. Nope. Right? So it, what, what is remarkable about this case is what has been left out. I think that's so critical. Bibi, do you have a comment? Thank, thank you, yes, a lot of a lot of people are talking in chat about his photos because he was always running around taking photos, but yet we see none of them. Correct. Um, Colburn uh, had a 35 millimeter camera, which is very interesting. It wasn't a digital camera; it was one with that you put ordinary film in, and so he went everywhere with his camera and he took photographs. Right, so he was everywhere. A uh, checking convictions. Do you have a comment? Oh no, BB got it. I was just going to mention something that he said in there. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Sunshine Christina. Yeah, that's interesting. Jacks brought up that Jacobs didn't write a single report. We know, wasn't it Jacobs that was handling the zipper of voicemail? Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. One of them. One of them recorded it on their phone, I believe, mm -hmm. and it's lost. Yep, and it's now missing. Um, yeah, correct, also, correct. Um, I would love to see the negatives from these film rolls that Colburn submitted as evidence. Well, well, put it this way. He was at Cuss Road twice, and he likely took photographs, right? So, in effect, he's the eyes and ears of the investigation without releasing those photographs if you know what i mean so they're like almost like a personal diary as things were unfolding at the salvage yard check 61 one more and, and it, you know this is going in line with what we're talking about things that went unreported remember the november 9th phone call that simple made to headquarters talking about what he'd found in the quarry the five gallon buckets of human bones he needed help he's begging for you know, bodies to come out and help scour the yard or the quarry. So he didn't write a single damn thing for that. Nothing. No, no. November, uh, and no, November 10th. Yeah. November uh, 10th. And, he, go ahead. No, no, no. Keep going, Jack. November 10th, he wrote a report. And he said he and other officers were looking at in, uh, other areas for additional evidence that goes with the burn pit. That was his words, Correct. really trying trying to tie what they had found in the quarry to the burn pit, which I think is complete crap. Correct, correct. Um, uh, Stuart Hodson uh, in the chat says uh, photos H1 and H2. Yeah, there's no question about it because um, H1 and H2 are actually referred on Kaczynski's, one of his notes, uh, and uh, he wrote, and on H1 and H2, it's dig site measurement uh, and something else, which will be and body, I think. So it'll be very, very interesting to see what H1 and H2 are all about. And it's quite likely that Colburn has got a lot of photographs that no one has ever seen. So it'd be very, very interesting. So like I said, he was... Colburn was absolutely everywhere. 
All right, guys, do we have any other comments? All right, we're all good. Okay, so what I've got here, just to finish off this section here, um, I'm going to read a couple of passages from the um, Stephen Avery trial. And uh, just, to, just so that the audience can hear the shenanigans that went on. So this is Ken Kratz during Stephen Avery's trial. And it's Colburn that's being questioned. And I quote, By the way, as you and Deputy Kaczarski and Lieutenant Link observed this, did any of the three of you approach or touch this piece of evidence at that time? Answer, I may have been standing in this area here. You know, this piece of furniture is only two and a half, three feet tall maybe, so I could easily see over it to see the key. I did not approach the key. Lieutenant Lenk did not come into the room. Deputy Kuchowski photographed the key from, you know, from whatever angle this picture was taken at. That's as close as we got. Question. My question again was, did either yourself, Lieutenant Lenk, or Deputy Kaczarski, prior to this photo was taken, touch that key? Answer, no, sir. Question, why not? Answer, I think all three of us knew at the same time that there was a very good chance seeing a Toyota emblem embossed on that key, knowing that Teresa Horbach's vehicle was a Toyota, that this was a very important piece of evidence. And, you know, none of us were going to taint that. I continue. Nearly finished. Let me ask you, Sergeant Colburn, you guys, you specifically, Lieutenant Link, and now Deputy Kaczarski, had been in this room for quite some time before this key appears in this position. Isn't that right? Answer, yes, sir. Question, did this surprise you that you saw this key there? Answer, yes. I was very surprised. Question, did the three of you talk about that? We hadn't seen it before. Anything like that? Answer. I, I believe I said to myself, damn, how did I miss that? <laughs> All right. Guys, do we have any comments uh, on Colburn and the key? I'm rolling uh, my eyes. <laughs> in, in, in did you feel... Yeah, did you feel me rolling my eyes too? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, I mean, guys, that, this is what went down in court in front of a judge and a jury. Checking convictions. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, you listen to the way it happened or whatever. You have to, I don't know, have your head in a cloud or something to even think that that would be realistic. Okay? I mean, I, I guess maybe... If if I was going to do that, I think I'd put a key between the magazines or something, you know? I mean, at least say sure. that. You know, it sounds a little more believable than I twisted a wooden cabinet and shook yeah. it around and, you know, make it sound like it's plastic. And that's, it just sounds so, well, like everything, unbelievable, you know? And I just well. keep, keep picturing <laughs> poor Andy with his yeah. eyebrows going to jump off his face. <laughs> when he's correct. telling this shit because he's such a liar, you know? Correct. 100% correct. And you know what? The the amazing thing is he wrote an email to his boss, um, and Jack61 will back me up on this, and he now comes up with a different story. That's that right. the key wasn't in the cupboard. It was actually behind the cupboard, right? So he now has changed tack because Link admitted looking into the cupboard and seeing nothing. <laughs> so so now Colburn, red face, had to change his story to say, oh, yeah, yeah, the key was at the back. And you know what was interesting? Uh, 
before I get everyone to uh, say something, Kathleen Zona said, uh, she, she wrote somewhere in a book, that she would have got Colburn to bring the cabinet in court and to reproduce what he did with the key and see if it, see if it actually comes out. Because her experts have tried, and I think the late Eric Cosi also tried, and could not get the key to fall out. A uh, BB. Yeah, and also the change on top that move in the, on that cabinet. Oh, correct, correct, correct. Yeah, so and, he's shaking <laughs> it about. But. Yes, correct. And uh, the, he was asked, well, why did you shake this cabinet? And he, he said he was upset because the, of the pornographic material that they were collecting. And it upset him. Oh, the him regular about, Playboy? Uh, correct. Oh, Playboy. Yeah. Stephen, yeah. Stephen Avery's Playboys, and uh, he got very yeah. upset, so he had to take it out on the cabinet. It wasn't like he had weird porn or something, so uh, it was no. like mild porn that you can easily access in a lot of places. Correct. You know? so, so if that's the case, imagine if he saw the um, violent, sadistic porn on the computer. In right. The that's right. What would what would have you have done? Drive a tractor through the house? It exploded, <laughs> right? Yeah. It exploded. Spontaneously <laughs> yeah. combusted, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Alice, Alice, do you have a comment? Thank you, thank you, Bibi. Alice. Yeah, I mean, you're just the fact that a lot of revolves are in this bloody cabinet, but yet the same cabinet they never used in trial. They never had it there to show the jury just exactly how this magical key magically fell out the back of this bloody cabinet. You know what I mean? And this is what they, they, they keep going on about is uh, they, they fell out the back of the cabinet. But if that was the case, then why was that cabinet not introduced as evidence? Because that is a big part of this whole story. You know what I mean? So you would think right. they would use that in the court. It's because they knew it was a load of bullshit and that there was no way that they could get away with it because Dean and Stra uh, Dean and Jerry would have used that in, in some sort of way to prove them wrong. That's correct. 100% correct. Uh, thank you, Alice. Uh, Bibi? Well, and uh, they make such a big deal out of finding it a Toyota key. Yeah, yeah, it is a big deal. But they're in a junkyard and... Almost everything that's in that trailer belongs to Riley Johnson, not Steve Avery, even the couch, Correct. everything. So, Correct. And they're at a junkyard. He could have one in the garage. He's fixing up out there somewhere in one of the shops. He could have owned South one. South yard is full of keys. Yeah. Right. But, Toyota right. is a huge percentage, yeah. I'm sure, 10% anyway, you know. Yeah. Correct. Correct. In that salvage yard. There would have definitely been Toyota Rex and Toyota vehicles in there for sure. And Toyota keys and stuff floating around. So, That's I mean, correct. granted, it is a big deal because it is a kind of car, but they are on a junkyard. So, correct. Rain salt, but, you know. But, uh, but, but, guys, when you think about it, it was another Pam of God moment. It was another Pam of yes. God moment. Oh, sure it was. All the way around. Yeah, it magically yeah. appeared. Correct. You know. Correct. Correct. A uh, checking convictions. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say. Well, it'll be real interesting when this Netflix thing comes through because there'll be a lot said about that because that's the main point of it, you know. Slandering, Correct. Slandering behavior of, on camera from an edit. Um, so, which I think is very funny. And um, it would. I was gonna mention that that there are so many keys in a junkyard that actually they would just have to make it look good, you know, for pictures and anybody around when they found the key, they could have you know, did whatever. Obviously they did. We know that because of the DNA. So it would have been really easy for them to just put on a, sh you know, a sham for a moment, you know? Yes. And in case any, you know, um, really stand up officers were around and wouldn't take no bullshit, you know, the whistle callers might have been yeah. around. So they could have just yeah. staged it for, you know, and then gave it to Correct. the name which never were, were any pictures, you know? And yes. somebody had said way, way before that about Colhan and the pictures, I didn't get the chance to say it, but do you think he was the one that was taking the situ pictures? <laughs> yeah, that's correct, correct, correct. Uh, the, look, there's no doubt, whatever whatever Colburn was taking, 
photographs of would have been very, very important. That is for sure. Right. And I think um, Colburn and Link had to really convince one person and that would have been Kucharski. You know, they had to, they couldn't fake it so badly that even Kucharski would have burst out in laughter. And that's probably why he made the comment about the aliens, right? That the aliens could yeah. put the gear there. Because I think even, even he realized how ridiculous the scenario was, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. I agree. I, I was just going to say, is that why he came up with, you know, the aliens could have done it? I mean, any. So now that's just my thing for everything. When something just magically appears, I say, oh, must have been delivered by the aliens. By the aliens. 100% correct. Uh, Jack 61. Which goes to show, I mean, the whole thing is contrived. I think we all agree. Which goes to show the links that Kratz went to in his closing arguments, which you talked about last week. Remember? Correct. Correct. This, he even this, ab he abandoned the key. Yeah. Let's just say that the key doesn't exist. Does it really matter, guys? I mean, come on. These cops were just trying to help the case out. He's, he's guilty. Correct. Correct. And you also said, uh, don't blame the police. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't blame the police for attempting to, uh, you know, um, tamper with evidence or plant evidence. Please don't blame them. They're only doing their job. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. The, the madness continues. All right, guys. Well, that wasn't the only shenanigan, right? There was another shenanigan involving Colburn. And I'm going to read this. It's, it's only short, but it's important. This is from the Stephen Avery trial. Colburn is being questioned by Dean Strang. I quote, this is Dean. I'm sorry, I apologize. What I meant is, you don't recall as you sit here today whether Mr. Wiegert gave you Teresa Horbach's license plate number when he called you on November 3? Answer, no, I just don't remember the exact context of our conversation then. Question, but, answer, he had to have given it to me because I wouldn't have had the number any other way. Question. Well, and you can understand how someone listening to that might think that you were calling in a license plate that you were looking at on the back end of a 99 Toyota from listening to that tape. You can understand why someone might think that, can't you? And notice, he doesn't respond, Ken Kratz does. I quote, it's a conclusion, judge. He's conveying the problem to the jury, the court. I agree, the objection is sustained. Question, this is strange. This call sounded like hundreds of other license plate or registration checks you have done through dispatch before? Answer. Yes. Question. But there's no way you should have been looking at Teresa Horbach's license plate on November the 3rd on the back end of a 99 Toyota. Again, Kratz interjects. Kratz, asked and answer, Your Honour, he already said he didn't and was not looking at the license plate. The court sustained strength. There's no way you should have been, is there? Answer, I shouldn't have been and I was not looking at the license plate. Question, because you are aware now that the first time that Toyota was reported found was two days later on November the 5th. Answer, yes, sir. Nearly finished. You were aware that it was found without its license plates. Answer, yes, sir. You are aware that the license plates weren't reported found until November the 8th, 2005? Yes, sir. So isn't that amazing, isn't that, amazing that the um, he's basically been, uh, the suggestion is, is that he was standing right behind the Toyota RAV4 when he called it, called it in. And when they found the RAV4, there were no license plate on them. 
checking convictions. Um, wow. As BB wow. would say, as what would BB say? Oh, that's convenient. Uh, correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, only thing I can say is um, you'd have to be um, two years old and not know how to unscrew a license plate to make that happen. Just so Kratz could use it. Come on. Correct. Now. I and mean, the and it did sound exactly like what a police officer would do if they came across a car they were stopping for speeding or whatever. It's the same kind of call, you know, and he just happened to slip up and say, oh, a 99. Um, Toyota. Right. Yeah. Whatever his wording was, but not, you know, okay. So that's when he he screwed up. Uh-oh, I should have looked at my M N D T and see what it said on there. I should remember that I just got told to pass this along because I'm the shift manager. You know what I mean? I mean, this Correct. is ridiculous. And that'll Correct. be another interesting thing to see how it comes out in court because these things are going to be brought up because Correct. these are the things that supposedly wrecked his life. You know what I mean? I, I, I agree. You should never threaten right. anybody. But it didn't wreck his yes. life. It didn't stop his career, you know? Yeah. So and, yeah, uh, my yeah. Thoughts, yeah, my thoughts on that are bullshit. Correct. I agree. And Ken Kratz was furious, was furious with Netflix the way they edited it. And I'll tell you what, what they did edit were Ken Kratz and the court's comments, Right. But the gist of the conversation was exactly the same. In other words, what Strang asked him, well, if you come across a car and it's abandoned or involved in an accident, you call in the plate. And Colburn said, yes, that's what he normally does. So he got caught. He got caught out in a lie. Sunshine Christina. I just, I think that um, the, the way that those who defend the verdict have tried to turn around the way making a murderer presented the testimony as in that's the reason why this looks guilty when in reality he didn't do anything wrong is just it's just ridiculous because if you read the transcript he sounds much more knowledgeable of how it appears and he sounds even more guilty of what he's done in the transcripts than it's a permit than it is presented on making a murderer. And I also think it's funny that Kratz leaves out that there was male DNA on the license plates that didn't yes. belong to Stephen or Brendan, that they chose to not determine who it did belong to. That's hundred percent correct. And Cole, um, Colhane was asked about that and she goes, Oh, the amount of DNA I got was so weak, I couldn't determine a profile. I just about fell off my chair. Or well, what you do is you go back, you re-swab, and you do another extraction. But here's the kicker. If, the, if they had the MVAC system, they would be able to vacuum clean up any DNA that's present on that number plate. And wouldn't it be very interesting to see whose DNA comes up on that number plate. Uh, Jack 61. Uh, Sunshine, are you talking about the VDers? I'm just curious. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. <laughs> that would be them. I call them enab state enablers, and that makes them mad too. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sunshine. No, I was just going to say, you can't say V-Deers on Reddit's Making a Murderer sub, though, or your whole entire ah. up will be removed. Oh, oh dear. Oh dear. Yes, I I very rarely post on Reddit. <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, Sammy. It's interesting that they had that word marked. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to pose it uh, in street language. He's a jack wagon. On the ass clown train. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just per say? Perfectly said. Jack can wagon put, on the ass clown train. I can we put it. that? Can, can we put that on a t-shirt, guys? Yeah. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we can finish the podcast right now. Now, nah, awesome. But what is interesting is this, right? 
two things. The number plates were folded in thirds. And the theory is the reason why they're folded in thirds is that you can easily put them in your pocket to hide them and transport them, right? <clears throat> Secondly, the number plates were found on the periphery of the Avery property where Stephen Avery lived. So very close to uh, that gravel road that goes down towards his trailer. So someone walking that perimeter or driving down that perimeter could have easily place the number plates in a vehicle. Put it this way, the point I'm trying to make is no attempt was made to hide the number plates. They were easily found and they were. Stephen Avery had access to a smelter and he could have smelted them down. No one would have found them. But they were placed in a vehicle uh, that could be easily found. It was deliberately not hidden at all. Uh, guys, any comments? Well, uh, uh, the, the vehicle, the vehicle, the plates were in, the windows were broke out of it. So they didn't even have to like open a door to put them in there. They just had to bloop, toss them in there through the broken window, right? Correct. 100% correct. You're right. And uh, the mere fact that it contained male DNA, but in low quantities, and that Colhane did not re-extract the genomic DNA, I think that speaks volumes. A Sunshine Christina. Um, I'm not sure if it was just mentioned, but that station wagon is also right on the edge of the road that connects Stephen and Barbara's trailer to the yes. back of the salvage yard. Andrew Colburn was in that area the days prior. He also... Yes searched cars in that area the day prior and it would have been very silly of Stephen Avery to remove the rav plates and then simply just what fold them up like a taco or a burrito and right. throw it's them correct. in a car closest closer to his house it's, correct, right? it's just yeah. once you really think about the evidence it's clear that someone was just simply moving it closer to Stephen's house. You start Correct. with the RAV, which gets them on the property, and then the license plates, which are a little bit closer, and then it just gets closer and closer. It's yep. it's just, it's, yeah. it's ridiculous once you know. Correct. I'm going to make a couple of little points here. They may be stupid as hell, but I'm going to do it. So, whether it's Chino work pants, those have, in the men's pants, have very big pockets. Yes. In the front. And um, the pants that law enforcement wears has a million pockets that are big. So if you're folding it in threes, it could fit in one of them pockets. Oh, yeah. Very easily. Oh, plus you could just put it in your patrol car. Oh, and they right? got vets with the inside pockets, too, you know, that they wear in their oh, jackets. Yeah. Their jackets are very, have, their pockets are so big. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Very, very interesting indeed. Jet 61. D just to summarize, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, this is according kind of a summary like you did before, but a summary of the license plate and the RAV4. According to what Colburn originally said that Mark Wigert had passed on, or Rimmick, or I'm not sure which one, but I think it was Wigert, had passed on this car information to Colburn. In addition to that, at 6.53 p.m. on the 3rd, an alert went out for Teresa, along with the description of her RAV and the license plate. So he already knew. He should have known. In addition to that, he went back to HQ after his shift, which I'm sure that they were talking about the, the, all this stuff anyway, when they were making plans to go to the zippers. Correct. Correct. Uh, his, his story doesn't hold water. The, the fact that, you know, a fellow police officer, or in this case, uh, uh, Wigert, gave them all the details, gave them the description, and then Colburn would then call dispatch. Uh, just it, doesn't ma it doesn't make sense at all. No, no, it doesn't make sense because... It's sort of like saying, well, I don't trust what the lead investigator is telling me, 
I'm just going to confirm it with dispatch, who would have the same information that Mark Wiggett would have had, right? The dispatcher isn't going to get it out of thin air, right? So they had the details. And I think someone in the chat said, well, maybe he was surprised seeing a blue car. Right, and uh, that actually makes a lot of sense because on all the missing uh, posters it was dark green, and remember what Pamela God said? Oh, it looks like a blue green. Aren't we looking for? That's yep. what he said to Shane Hagel. That's so right. even she was surprised by the color of the Rav Four, right? And so when Pamela God found it, there were no number plates on it. So she had to get confirmation by reading the VIN number, right? Whereas Colburn, if he was standing behind the RAB, all he had to do was read the number, the plate number, and get it confirmed. So it looks mighty suspicious that he indeed came across the RAB, a blue one, and called in the plates. I could be wrong, but I tell you what, that's exactly what it sounds like. All right, guys, do we have any other comments? All right, so I just wanted to bring everybody up to date with what Colburn did. As you can see, he was absolutely everywhere, searched everywhere, found a lot of evidence, took a lot of photographs. Now, what we'll do, we're going to finish. Uh, oh, Sammy, do you have a comment? Yeah, Pete Moss just said Colburn was also involved in finding remnants of a cell phone at Cuss Road. Then later that day, that day, it was found in Stevens' burn barrel. Just say it. Yeah, yeah, very interesting because in Stephen Avery's uh, burn barrel, they did find the electronics that belonged to Teresa Horbach. So the question is, how did they get there? And it's interesting, you know, it's amazing how the evidence is all around Stephen Avery's property. It all points to Stephen Avery. And that's exactly what you do if you're planting evidence. You point only to one person. The problem is, cremains were not just found in the burn pit. They were found in Yonder Burn Barrel Number 2. Furthermore, they were found at the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit. So the cremains were spread everywhere. So the story wasn't as neat as what the MTSO and the state were trying to make it. Plus, imagine their frustration when the crime lab walked in to Stephen Avery's bedroom and found no evidence, no evidence that Teresa Horbach had actually been in there. They find the key. Does the key have Teresa Horbach's DNA fingerprint? No, it only contains Stephen Avery's DNA and what's worse is the amount of DNA found on that key is about tenfold higher than when Stephen Avery held an exemplar key. So all the DNA levels are all wrong, right? And it, it's like if someone wanted to, in quote, improve a piece of evidence, that's what you do. You contaminate it with the person that you're trying to set up with their DNA or their blood. They're not after perfection. The answer is, well, his DNA is on that key. That's good enough for me. But that's the way the jury would have seen it and the judge would have seen it. All right, guys, do we have any comments? All right, we're all good. Beautiful. So, guys, let's continue with the podcast proper and finish off uh, chapter 11. Now, the important thing to realize is that <laughs> it wasn't just Colbert. It was also a uh, link as well. So I quote, meet villain number two, Andy's colleague, Lieutenant James Link, a former Detroit cop, he joined the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department in 1988 and by 2005 headed the detective unit. When Sergeant Colburn heard about Avery's exoneration in 2003, 
and decided to mention the call from eight years earlier in case it might be somehow related, Lieutenant Link talked to Sheriff Ken Peterson about the call and had no further involvement. I asked Jim Link why he volunteered to help Calumet County and DCI on November the 5th, just three weeks after being deposed. And Jim explained, I quote, I was a trained evidence tech, the one resource they badly needed on the 5th. Andy, Dave Remicker and I were the sheriff's employees who had been the least involved in any of the Stephen Avery cases. And Remicker volunteered the three of us. It was because we were not involved with Avery that we participated in the searches. Here's the question. If that's the case, why was the elected county coroner, Deborah Kakich, threatened with arrest if she set foot on the Avery Salvage Yard when she had zero conflict of interest? What made Lenk and Colburn exempt? Jack 61. Well, they were given it. I mean, this is my opinion. I, I, I'm not basing this on any kind of really factual thing other than the fact that they were given a pass. Clearly nothing happened to them. They were assigned these duties. You know, and I even, I really think that Kratz knew that they went way too far in what they were doing. Uh, and as for, you know, Deb, Ke- Deb Kekach, um, what they did to her is, is really an abomination, in my opinion. I had this argument. Yeah, I had this argument, and Christina, I know, has probably seen uh, this post as well and read it, arguing with um, Gilter about um, it. Really, was a conversation about how Ken Kratz behaved during that interview with Rookie for convicting a murderer. Oh yes, and, <laughs> exactly. And oh, it, yeah. it, the conversation grew from that into various stages. And somebody said, well, you know, they didn't have, they didn't allow a corner on the scene. And then it, the argument took off as that, well, you know, someone was called, but that's not the same. Right. And so it, right. it went from that. What they did to her, you know, a corner, no, they don't necessarily have the specialized skills to do all these various functions. However, they make sure that those people are available and will come and do whatever they need to do to a, to a scene. That's what her their function is. Correct, correct. And the uh, the coroner brings her own team of specialists in, and you know that the coroner would be extremely thorough in documentation. Correct. That's right. That's right. And the, and the one thing that we're sadly lacking in this case is proper documentation and crime scene analysis. It's absolute garbage. That's what we've got. Uh, Alice, do you have a comment? Yeah, the the simple fact is, Doc, is that they knew she wouldn't play the game. I agree. She wasn't, she wasn't a participant in the game because, if I remember correctly, and, and what we've done with um, the research and everything like that, she was involved with another case and they asked her to do something and she refused to do it. I think it was to do that's with correct. the Ripley Horstegler case. Yes, that's um, correct. And they asked her to do something, and she was like, no way, I'm not doing that. So they knew that she was not going to be part of the group. And they knew for them to get away with what they wanted to do, there was no way that they could have her on that property. Because as you said, she would have done it properly. She would have brought in her own people. She would have sectioned it off. She would have done it like an archaeological dig by grids and things like that. And that is not what they wanted. So that is why, in my opinion, that they threatened her, even though she could have arrested them, she had to make a a serious decision, is it worth my while? Because she might have been able to get on there and she might have been able to have arrested them then, but she's also got to think about afterwards as well. And they could have made her life a living hell. 
and uh, uh, no wonder correct, she was correct. scared. Correct, correct. In fact, uh, it wasn't too long, but Deborah Kakich resigned. She felt uh, very intimidated and threatened. Uh, inexplicable, Susan. Yeah, also the fact that Judge Willis did not allow her testimony just speaks volumes. Correct, correct, um, correct. You no, know, the defense was that there was um, uh, funny business going on by these cops, and he didn't see the relevance in in this thing with with not allowing Debbie because I mean it just you know another point that Willis was was uh, for the prosecution. Oh, he was a complete stooge, a complete yeah. stooge. It was just simply unbelievable. He could find no relevance in anything. <laughs> I I read Dub Kakach. I read Dub Kakach for the recording, and all she got to testify was her con her her uh, credentials. Correct, correct. Yeah. And it was and then, it was gone. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. They pull Sorry. everyone and say nope, and that's it. Then she's gone. Yeah, and it was Garn who called her a disgruntled employee. Ex-employee, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, checking convictions. Yeah, just real quickly before uh, Sunshine, who's had her mic undone, um, I just wanted to say that uh, being the judge, um, there's a, you know, hierarchy, you know, how it goes. And yes. Have, well, she should have had the same respect to her you know he should have the same respect to her as she does to him at yes. the level of you know how they do that with you know you're the higher up um she was just as high as him as a judge in fact uh, higher actually i mean she can't make decisions like that but she's legally you know so i i find it really disrespectful also that he didn't notice you know her you know, credentials or, you know. Correct. Like, yeah. Correct. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm just having Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. the, 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 thing, the thing is that the excuse that they keep on saying was the reason why Lincoln, Colbert and Remaker were there all the time was because they needed specialists in collecting evidence. Right? Yeah. So that right. gave them a free pass. Yet, the Cremains in the burn pit and also Cust Road the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit and Yonder Burn Barrel Number Two is evidence, forensic evidence. Why wasn't the coroner called? Why did they quickly sift all the material and then told the coroner, "Don't come onto the salvage yard"? Uh, Sunshine, Christina, Linda, I think what you're trying to uh, one of the points you're trying to make is that it seems like. They have very little respect of females in authoritative position. Thank you. Um, exactly. When, when I was reading the uh, the DOJ 2003 investigation into the 85 case, Risa Evans, which was Stephen's public defender for those cases, made a comment that during a hearing, she was blatantly disrespected by Vogel to the point where I guess they had a meeting in chambers and he actually apologized to her, but, um, and it had to do with discovery, like not being able to get to the records to adequately defend her client. And then you think about how they try and minimize Zellner now. Yes how successful she is in her field. These are men who, who don't value women and their contributions. They, they definitely have a very, um, a very minimizing opinion of a woman's capability. Also, I wanted to mention that did, I don't think Buting and Strain were able to connect the dots that no coroner or forensic anthropologist went to the salvage yard, but yet they did go, they did have County Met County coroner go, Cleaser go to Manitowoc County quarry. I think if they had found Greg Shedder's page for a coroner um, that has been found in the radio transmissions, as well as 
the fact that Kaiser was in the quarry the same day he pronounced Teresa deceased yeah. um, and maybe had pre presented that to Willis because Willis did his best to make sure that there's nothing that was done that could lead to a an overturning of the ver verdict. That was his yes. role. His role was yes. to ensure that as as awful as this whole thing do was done, it was done legally by the book. And I think if Muting and String had been able to introduce those facts onto the record, Willis would have had to have rethought his blatant dismissal um, of Kakadich and her relevancy into the trial. So that's Correct. just my opinion. Correct. Correct. Well, the, 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 th thank you, Sunshine. The excuse that they used was that um, uh, Deborah Kakadich worked for the MTSO, so um, she couldn't be on the property because it would be seen as a form, as a form of uh, conflict of interest. Yet Colburn, Link, Remica, Bushman, and a whole lot of other MTSO officers were absolutely everywhere. Um, Bibi, do you have a comment? One more thing on minim minimalizing the women. We have to keep in mind the effigy burning that uh, Bass and Baldwin did. So they were obviously disgruntled at the men that they worked with. Uh, correct, correct. So it depends on the uh, culture that was in the MTSO at that time. Probably very male orientated. The you know the good old boys club, the good old boys club, and all the issues that that brings. If you're a female in that particular type of environment, would have been very very uh, devastating. Uh, Inexplicable Susan, do you have a comment? Uh, the fact that you know they say that about Kakich, but they don't call another a different coroner. I mean, the site required a coroner. Period. Correct. So, okay, Correct. okay, you know, their stupid excuse, but they should have been calling another corner. But, but if you notice what they did, it was very, very devious. They collected the cremains first, then the coroner found out about it. So they never caught a coroner in the first place. Their aim was to get to the burn pit, other places, collect the evidence, take it off the salvage yard, and then process it. And destroy so, the burn pit. Yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah. So instead of meticulously going through the burn pit, they got skid steers and they completely demolish the burn pit. So you can no longer go back and say, hey, look, boys, this burn pit area is so tiny you can't even cook a chicken on it. What are you Inexplicable. doing? Inexplicable. Correct. Inexplicable, Susan, you're correct. <laughs> um, Alice, do you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that annoys me the most um, about this whole situation with the coroner and everything like that is the, the, they turn around and they say, oh, it's a conflict of interest. Well, every officer from the Manaswap County is a conflict of interest, but they were on the proper aid. They're the ones that are finding evidence. They are the ones that are handing out evidence to bloody witnesses in a frigging court of law. That's correct. Where is the conflict? Of, where, where is that no conflict of interest? Where is that no intimidating witnesses are trying to intimidate Stephen or Brendan when the same police that are corrupt and planted this evidence and shouldn't have been anywhere near it are the ones that are handing these things out at court. I mean, that is just fucking right. ridiculous. And I cannot <laughs> get over the fact that these courts can do that because I guarantee you that is one thing that would not happen in a frigging court in Scotland. I mean, there's a police officer that has just been sentenced to life imprisonment yes, because yes. he murdered um, yes. a young lass called Sarah Everard last yes. year, and he was off. He was an, he was off duty, and he stopped her, pretending that he was going to um, thing me up for uh, 
uh, for being out of uh, yeah, COVID, on the COVID, COVID restriction, COVID breach, yes. you know, kidnapped her, raped her, strangled her, you know, and, and he's going to be sentenced to life. And burnt her. That's how it should be. That's how it should be done. That's how this should be handled. So these the police officers in that should not have been anywhere near that fucking courtroom or even in that fucking court at all, in my opinion. I'm so sorry about my language, but this just really annoys me. No, come on, Alice. Tell us what you really think now. <laughs> They're all fucking tossers, Doc. They're all tossers. <laughs> what, what, what can you do? What can you... Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, checking convictions. Um, yeah, I did. Um, I'm kind of dazed here, but there is a question from T1. Did that get answered or said? I don't think no. so. What, what, read no. It, read it. What? It says, yeah. how long before the trial did the coroner leave her position? KK mentioned her um, being a disgruntled former employee. What made her disgruntled? Is there anything supporting that claim? Well, that um, that 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 was actually directed by Garn, right? Norm Garn said that in the trial. Uh, now, what is interesting was that there was an officer that went to see Deborah Kakach before she went on the stand, right? And he asked, "This is a fellow officer," and he asked her, "Oh, do you realise you're going to be, um, you've been called up to the trial?" And she goes, "Oh." Well, I, I've got nothing to add. You know, I, I, that's a bit of a surprise. But I have a feeling she said that so that she can actually say what she wanted to say on the stand. Garn, Kratz and Fallon knew the deal. And that's why they put a complaint to the judge and the judge marched her out of the courtroom. And the, the jury marched out and no one heard a damn thing. So they've actually... They actually muzzled their own coroner, their own employee, and uh, we did a we did a, a presentation on Deborah Kakach, and she said that she felt so unsafe that she resigned. Now, um, to answer T one, um, I'm not sure what the time frame was, uh, but the reason why they said disgruntled employee is because she appeared in court and her the Garn reckons that her only motivation for appearing in court is to complain so hence being disgruntled and the reason why they barred her from speaking in court is that she never was at the salvage site so their argument is well she wasn't involved what's she doing here jack 61 doctor i think she left six months after okay uh, Bren brendan's trial was over i think that's right Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, we can check. Uh, I did a presentation on Deborah Kakach. I think it's in there. Yeah. She um, she was pretty pretty upset. But but here's here's the real kicker. Right. The cremains uh, found in the burn pit. They were examined by Dr. Benner. Right. He never went to the salvage yard. He was as BB said. He was given a box of bones. After Bennett saw those cremains, the box of bones went to Dr. Eisenberg. And so she examined those cremains. She was asked, did you ever step foot in the salvage yard to have a look? And she admitted that she did not. So he's a forensic anthropologist looking at critical cremains. She had no idea where they came from. And she was asked, well, how do you know where they come from? I take it in face value from what the police and investigators have told me. Bang. So she's got no information or photographs from a coroner. So she just accepts that face value. Here's a box of bones. Tell me what they are. Right. Uh, does anyone want to comment on that one? Okay, uh, Sunshine Christina. I just want to say that that white corrugated box of bones is a pet peeve of mine, and uh, it just oh, yeah. tell us, tell us, yeah. tell us, Sunshine. Well, 
Well, here's the thing. So I believe it's Bennett that first mentions receiving a white box of bones, a white corrugated box of bones on the 8th, I think is when they brought them to him. And Correct. And here to say uh, purportedly human from a site unknown to me, there, he mentions no tag numbers. He mentions nothing. It's just a box of bones. It could have come from, for all this gentleman knows, you know, from Timbuktu. And uh, he makes his 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 uh, examination and his findings. And then the next that we hear about it, record-wise, all of a sudden it has tons of tag numbers attached to it. Yet these are reports that are authored month, months later about activities allegedly occurring that day. And I personally think that if the t box would have had tags numbers at that time, Bennett would have noted them because he's very particular about his description of the box. Correct. He everything he can about it. Yet he mentions not one evidence tag number. It just, there's something no. about box of bones and and yes. how it morphs to something that has tons of tag numbers attached to it that it just doesn't sit right with me. Correct. Correct. It's a jumbled mess, essentially. And uh, what you find is, is that you might have a bag with one tag number and within that bag, you've got other bags with their own tag numbers. So you have a degree of complexity with those tag numbers, and it's almost impossible to follow what's going on. Uh, Jack 61. Yeah, Sunshine, Christina, and I have discussed this aspect of when do they actually tag these bones? And it, it becomes a real question because of what she said about Bennett not mentioning any tags at all. And as this box is handled, and not only that, Look at the if you look at the reports, um, plus any motions uh, going all the way back to you know early January of 2006, and follow and see how little tag numbers are actually mentioned. It's just, it's worth yeah. a thought, and it is curious. It is yes. Uh, my understanding was that the whole box was given one tag number. I think it was eight three one eight. The whole box. That's right. All the that's right. And then I think once uh, once Eisenberg got access to them, what she did was she subdivided the cremains into different body segments. And I think that's probably the origin of the tag numbers, the, the different tag numbers emanating from that box. But further cremains were coming in, right, that Weigert was handing over. So the complexity was getting worse. Sunshine Christina. Well, here's the thing. We have not, as far as I know, if, if we do, please show me. We do not have one photograph of a evidence tag number attached to debris allegedly containing human remains from the Avery salvage yard taken on the Avery salvage yard. All of these tag numbers were affixed to the evidence once it had been brought to Calumet County. So we have to trust investigators who we have tons of evidence have lied about everything that they Correct. are they are truthful in where these debris piles are coming from. Correct. I personally but don't believe they toted debris piles from Manitowoc County Quarry to the burn pit. I think they did it all after the fact at Calumet County Garage on paper. They're lazy, you know? And yes. I think what yes. happened is 8675 somehow never got transferred or further obfuscated to make it look like it didn't originate in the Manitowoc County Quarry. Someone yeah, forgot correct. to link 8675 to the burn print pit tag, correct. I think is 7923. 
Yeah. You know, it was just an oops. And that's the only reason they got caught. 8675 is the only one that uh, you can really trace back quite a ways that um, in this mix of bones that we're talking about, it it does show up, which is kind of weird. And these other ones don't. That's even weirder. So, yeah, there's something here that we're missing. But we're going to continue. We're going to continue to pursue it and see what we can find. Correct. Correct. In fact, oh. in fact, further on that, anyone who has a lot of knowledge about the tagging system um, and how how they they branch out, please reach out to Jacks and I, and and anyone and, and anyone who helps or who wants to help try and figure this out. Let's try and all get together and share what we know and see if we can't further link it to to other things to see if maybe you know there's more to it correct and uh, you have to admit eisenberg's reports are a nightmare they're an absolute nightmare uh in in terms of the way it has been written uh the way you she has uh different dates a whole stack of tag numbers and cremains going absolutely everywhere it's an absolute nightmare to follow uh, Jack 61. Yeah, sorry, Sunshine. Well, no, go ahead and let Jacks go first. Jack 61. The only thing that I, and I don't even know that this is factual and how this works, but from what I was told, evidence tags were passed out per officer per day. They were assigned per officer per day. But that doesn't really work if you look at how the tagging got uh, some of the tags got completely altered. If you go down through the ledger list, they're scratched out and a new tag number is written. Something uh, really, yeah, something really weird happened there. So, but correct. I've never found out for sure exactly uh, in a document how that worked. Correct. But guys, that's all fantastic. Hold, hold the powder dry because don't worry, we're going to talk about the bones in the later chapter. I promise. Ken Kratz writes about the bones as well. So we'll definitely discuss that. I'm keen to finish uh, Link because we're talking, we're talking about Lieutenant Link here. So, but excellent discussion. Let me continue. The defense team's accusations of evidence tampering began in February of 2006. And by the time of the trial, a year later, Link's picture would be plastered across newspapers with captions reading, Police Corruption Alleged. Angry as he was then, Jim never said a word in public. A quote, the attorneys had no evidence but needed to blame someone. Jim says now, for the first time in my life, I thought, I don't need to be in this profession if this is going to be how I am treated. So here's the question. Why did the defense team target Link with evidence planting? Why did they target Link? Sammy. Well, he was supposed to be a babysitter, right? Uh, correct, yes. Yes, he was. Uh, inexplicable Susan. He was in the right place at the right time, many times. He was, yes, he was in the right place at the right time. Yes. Jack 61. There's some older documentation from back in the 90s that his name also appeared on, remember? With the... Um... Fingernail, fingernail scrapings and the hair, the hair and yes. So another yeah. pointed direction that he had access. Yes, but he 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 was particularly targeted about getting access to the blood vial, the 1996 blood vial. Oh, being able to get gain entry to the clerk's office. Yep. 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 And uh, according to um, James uh, Lieutenant Link, he didn't even know that there was a blood vial. Is that possible that he had no idea that there was a blood vial? Jack 61. I have to believe that he did know, but I can't prove it. Right. So, therefore, 
he he can say he can easily say in court, no, I didn't know anything about it, right? But remember, the defense, Strang and Butin, went with the concept that Lenk was able to gain access to the blood vial and either him or Colburn planted the blood in the RAV4, right? Now, Kathleen Zellner's experts have told her, forget about the blood vial. The blood didn't come from the blood vial. It came from fresh blood because they did DNA methylation studies. So in effect, Kathleen Zellner was very frustrated that the defense went with that uh, viewpoint. But here's the problem. You can't just say, I believe my client was framed. You have to say in court who framed your client and pr make a direct connection to the blood vial to that person. The only person that could have had a, a possible connection was Lieutenant Link, and that's why he was named. Guys, anybody else? All right, we're all good? Excellent. Okay. Now, mind you, that really, really upset Pratt, Garn, and Fallon when both Link and Colburn were accused of planting evidence, right? Got very nasty. I'll say the next quote. Uh, colleagues in the sheriff's department joked that the Avery defense lawyers couldn't have picked two worse guys to accuse of dishonesty as they chosen the two straightest arrows in the department. Everyone knew Jim and Andy as 100% honest. So here's the question. Did this imply that there were dishonest law enforcement officers in the MTSO? Checking, Chris, uh, sorry, checking convictions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Were they saying every other one was corrupt <laughs> and you can ch only trust them to or what? I yeah. just have to add during the trial when uh, Dean Strain was questioning Link um, about the blood vial about, well, I'm not sure which it was, Key maybe even, he said, um, he said, well, I am, he goes, I might be uh, a lot of things, but I'm not deaf as enough to think that this is going to be a Perry Mason moment. Correct. And the That's police correct. police officer is going to come correct. up here under all to tell us the truth. Yeah, but what, what, sorry, Chicky, what was bizarre, what was bizarre was that when Link was being, was when Link was being questioned, Strang said to him, would you admit to planting? Yes, sir, I would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you? No, sir, I did not. <laughs> so, so in other words, he would be truthful if he planted evidence and he would, in a court of law, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it was me. I did it all along. Yep. That's what, the the hell these guys, what the hell were these guys smoking? Yeah, and that was that's a why, amazing moment. <laughs> yeah, and that's why, that's why Strang says there'll be no way anyone would admit to anything. That's the yeah. whole idea. Yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Correct. Uh, That's BB, why. Have... Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, John. Uh, go ahead, BB. Okay. BB. Uh, it's like, uh, you found another embedded confession right there. That's an embedded confession that those guys are straight. Correct. Heroes. Correct. Yes. Correct. Which means that I would say that the corruption right. is rife in that department. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and the other guy, the other law enforcement officers are probably laughing their heads off, going, cheapers. What did they pick these two guys? There's plenty of bad apples in this place. And in better confession, I agree. Sunshine uh, Sunshine Christina. Well, that's why Kucharski brought up aliens, because he wasn't gonna say that Link or Colburn is res are responsible for the key because you don't rat on fellow officers. So one hundred and correct. And there have been many cops who have commented 
throughout the years on Reddit who have said that no cop is ever going to admit that they flub with evidence to secure convictions. It just Correct. isn't done. Correct. Right? Yeah, you, I got. I gotta say this, Doctor Sutton. Who knew <laughs> this is from T one? Who knew Link was related to George Washington? I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm, t I'm telling you. Uh, look, I'm disappointed. We need to get T one on the panel. Who agree? Who votes for T one to come on the panel? Oh, yeah, in. Check, yeah. check mark. He doesn't talk. Yeah, he talk, yeah, yeah but he, 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 he hogs the conversation. I don't know, Doc. Correct. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> we can, we, he, can do, he can do a robo voice if he wants to. Sure. <laughs> That'll work. Yeah. Let's get T1 on. Uh, all the same. Yeah. All the same as him not talking. On the panel. All this time of him not talking, if we get him talking, we may never be able to get him to stop. Uh, that's a good point. He's that's got all these point. years of it built up inside of him. And we'll <laughs> die wearing diapers because we're going to pee our pants laughing. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. No, come on, checking convictions. We're serious on this channel. <laughs> all, yeah. all right. Well, look, guys, I've just got two more questions to go, and we're done. we are finished this chapter. All right. I quote. Like everyone else who was involved, as soon as this thing came out, our sense of safety and peace was gone. This is Link. Reporters followed us around town, sticking microphones in our faces so bad that we had to seek refuge at the local police station. Death threats, nasty comments, from strangers in restaurants. It's unbelievable that I'm now known for being a crooked cop. Eight days after making a murder release, James Link suffered a serious heart attack, directly attributed to the stress and emotional upheaval of being accused of corruption and dishonesty all over again. Here's my question to the panel. Did the MTSO ever consider the devastating impact on Stephen and his family for the events of 1985 when he was wrongfully accused for the violent sexual assault of Penny Bernstein? Who would like to answer that one? Checking convictions. Absolutely not. I mean, they took a man from his three-week-old twins. They... Um said that every one of them were fabricators and liars. And do you think they had any, but no, absolutely not. Well, that's why it, it, it really bites my ass that, that Colburn has enough balls to try to sue Netflix for damages. When, if you look at Stephen Avery and his family, the damages Correct. Uh, the totality of that is 10 times worse than anything they can imagine. Correct, correct. But the amazing thing is that Ken Kratz always looks at one side of the coin. There is, there is no balance. Yeah, and when he talks about, yeah, when he talks about the 1985 wrongful conviction, right, when, when Stephen Avery was released in 2003, he fobs it off completely disarms it, fobs it off, says got nothing to do with nothing, and carries on. Yet the wrongdoings to Colburn and Link, he really expands and explodes it. Alice. Yeah, I mean, all I can say to that is, all <laughs> me. What about that family? What they done to that family? You know what I mean? Stephen spent all that time in the jail for something that he did in the day. Fair enough, he was to spend, what, six years for what he done to his cousin and everything like that. Right. That's fair enough. But the rest of it, where were all of them crawling out the fucking woodwork to give Stephen and his family an apology or anything like that? Nowhere. 
So I'm sorry, I've got no sympathy for them whatsoever. So friggin' what? They got a few death threats. They got a few people saying that they were nasty, dirty bastards. Well, that's tame compared to what that they put that family through. So every single one of them should be apologising to that family and fucking Stephen and Brendan, but I can never see that going to happen. No, that won't happen. When uh, Remember when Peg Lockenschlager uh, went through the report and wrote the report? She essentially exonerated everyone. No one was at fault. No one needs to go to prison. No one's at fault. Lack of communication. See you later. Don't come back. So, yeah, exactly, Doc. Exactly. The, the fact that they, they investigated themselves, there was no way that they were going to find themselves to have done anything wrong. You know what Correct. I mean? But because making a murderer has been made and it's actually pointing out their wrongs and their plan and, and their corruption and everything like that and they don't like it, they expect everybody to bow down to them and say, uh, you know, oh, oh, we've had death threats, we are getting this, we are getting that. Well, hell fucking mend you because it's you that have done this to yourselves. No making a murderer and no Stephen Avery. Correct. And uh, the amazing thing is this, uh, before I get on to Jack 61, the amazing thing is this, none of this would have happened to Lenk or Colburn if they had stayed away. Do you agree? Do you agree, guys? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, 100%. There will be no vitriol directed towards Lenk or Colburn if they had stayed away. None Stuart Hudson had just said that in chat too. That's the thing. Correct, correct. So had they listened and let Calumet get in there and do all the uh, forensic analysis, evidence gathering, no one would have said anything against Colburn and Link. They are like Ken Kratz, moth to a flame. Jack sixty one. You know, we don't know the, to the total extent of how far they vilified the family in 85, but that, I know they did, but we don't have you know, access to uh, all the media uh, reports. But then you fast forward to 2005, what happened? They really vilified them. And not only that, they drug Brendan down the drain too. And they didn't care. They don't care. No, that's correct. 100% correct. Uh, thank you, Jack61. Sunshine Christina. I just want to mention that Stephen's right to be a father to his children was stolen from him by these gentlemen. Um, and uh, they knew what they were doing when they did it. So, um, and also, this is just a personal theory. I think that Manitowoc County was allowed to participate to kind of obfuscate from all the other wrongful acts being done by other agencies. It kept the focus on Manitowoc County, which would allowed everyone else to do what they had to do to secure these wrongful convictions. Yeah, correct, correct, 100% correct. Yeah, I mean, the whole situation is just shocking and terrible. Uh, Sammy, do you have a comment? Well, to what Christina just said, I feel like their participation kind of magnifies and amplifies the fact that this was uh, something just to get Avery. Uh, to answer your question, no. And to the rest of them cops, I just say, guess what? If the shoe fits, wear it. Correct. And uh, there was a, uh, a segment in uh, Man 1, I think it was, where you had Barb, uh, Chuck, and Mama Avery, and they had a whole stack of mail, all hate mail. So they copped it left, right, and center. Their business suffered. Uh, clients went elsewhere. It was a real downturn for all of them. And remember, Stephen's in prison for 18 years, right? His, some of his children don't talk to him. Some of his children don't want to be involved with him. The whole, it, it, it destroyed his life, right? So he had a 
tremendous great effect on Stephen. And it wasn't his fault. He never wanted that attention, but he got it. All right, guys. Well, we've got one final question and we're done with this chapter. I quote, it felt like I was punched in the stomach the first time these attorneys accused me and Andy of planting evidence. Actually, I thought the Avery was entitled to compensation for being wrongfully convicted and in prison for all those years. Not only was I not upset that he sued the county, I thought he deserved to be paid. Stephen Avery may have deserved, this is now Ken Kratz, Stephen Avery may have deserved to be paid for the injustice visited upon him in 1985. But surely Andy Colburn and Jim Link deserve none of what they've suffered in the wake of Avery's arrest and later the release of Making a Murderer. What compensation are they entitled to? So here's the question. Did Link really believe that Stephen Avery deserved to be compensated? And isn't it interesting that in this chapter, both Link and Colburn believe in Stephen Avery being compensated, both of them? Who, can, who would like to answer that one? Uh, Alice. Alice. Oh, what a load of bollocks. What a load of bollocks. There's no way on hell that they thought that Stephen was entitled to that money because if they did, they wouldn't have done what they did because Stephen's not going to be daft enough to get out and have all that money coming to him for it to be taken away from him just like that. You know what I mean? So uh, Colburn, Link, Kratz, Gan, Fallon... The fucking lot of them, they all deserved what's coming to them and what came to them after man came out. Every single one of them. No matter how much they uh, they thought that Stephen was entitled to a penny or a few thousand or whatever, they they deserved everything that they got after man came out, in my opinion. And it's, they need even more, even worse done to them. Correct, correct. But the the amazing thing is, right, look what King Kratz actually did. He solicited a comment from Colburn and Link, both stating, yeah, 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 I don't care if Stephen got billions. He deserved it, right? He turned his life around. And it's interesting that on the uh, other foot, both Link and Colburn were accused of planting evidence. Isn't that incredible? Jack 61. Which brings up an exact point that I was going to make, is if they were, if they really were concerned, you know, this key business, um, that turns, I mean, in my opinion, this turns all the evidence on its head because if you're willing to mess with one piece of evidence, you're willing to mess with it all. Correct. That's my, so, the, yeah, I, I just, I don't agree with any of the death threats that they got. I, that I, I don't think that no. should have ever happened. I don't think, uh, you know, you know, getting people being angry because it, they feel like that a police officer that they may have respected or looked up to may have had some involvement in putting someone in prison wrongfully because they felt like he was guilty. Doesn't matter if he's guilty or not. If they thought he was guilty and they decided to help the case, to me, that's a it's a huge problem. And we know it happens. We've seen it in other cases. So, Unfortunately, that's correct. Yeah, Unfortunately, so, that's correct. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 Sorry, I think Jack. that that's okay. I just think that it's just really hypocritical of what Kratz is, is claiming in his book. I mean, come on. Correct, correct. So, in other words, the impression he's giving in his book, in this particular chapter, hey, Lincoln Colburn, they did nothing wrong. They got yeah. a lot of criticism. That's unfair. And on the same token, we're not going to mention what happened to the Averys or the Dassies. Right. So, you know, quid pro quo, right? Kratz doesn't want to know about it. Uh, checking conviction. Thank you, Jack 61. Checking convictions. 
Yeah, like uh, they say that ma'am is one-sided. Well, sorry, um, your book is like totally on you, Kenny. Oh, correct. His book, and uh, we've read enough of it now, is completely anti-ma'am. 100% anti-ma'am. And so everyone's waiting to see what the outcome is going to be with Colburn's trial against Netflix, because that'll be very interesting. A checking convictions. Yeah, that was going to be one of my points. I mean, uh, he's suing for something that um, Netflix has, or the producers, have no control over, which is a person's reaction to what they see. So uh, they had, even with that small edit, I don't, and I don't agree on it, but I don't think that was the only thing people took away from seeing them guys doing what they did and the whole thing in, in all of it. You know, they have no, I mean, the, the, the world could have turned against it and said, that's the worst film I ever seen in my life. Then what are you going right. to do? Well, because you weren't a star? I mean, do you know right. what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, I and, think yeah. and the the other thing we mustn't forget was um, they were asked, all the law enforcement guys were asked, do you, know, do you want to give your side of the story? And I'm not sure what actually happened, but I believe they were informed not to be involved. That's the impression I got, not to get involved. And they weren't. And that's why the directors of Making a Murderer listed all the people that were asked but were decided not to get involved. Uh, Bibi. Uh, T1 says, I think the crime was supplied to MTSO by Calumet. MTSO needed a crime. Calumet didn't. Correct. That would put it this way. Link and Colburn were finding a lot of the incriminating evidence, right? And they just happened to be there at the right time in the right place. And don't forget, Stephen Avery's bedroom is very, very small. And they had up to four officers in the bedroom for two and a half hours. And they awesome. never found that key. And they never found that key. Sunshine Christina. They did not have four men in that tiny room at one time. It's yet yeah. another lie. Um, I recently scanned the motion that was just filed in the Making a Murder Andrew Colburn civil suit, and it is such an odd that I don't understand how these people think they're in the same atmosphere as we are. Um, yes. It's just unbelievable the, the power they think they have. And another thing I wanted to mention from day one, Riccardi and Demos have first, they have never came out publicly and said Stephen and Brendan are innocent or are guilty. They have always said that this was a criminal justice piece meant to yeah. spark a conversation. They have very clearly made that clear and or very clearly made that known that they, you know, they don't, they believe they, they did not get fair trials and they believe that the process by which the investigation and the trials were done needs to be analyzed and talked about to see if changes should be made because, yeah. you know, and so for Colburn to be upset because he appears in a bad light is not their fault because no. years of research, research has shown us that making a murderer was very kind to the officers in the state of Wisconsin. The stuff that has been discovered after making a murderer makes them look entirely more culpable of, of behaving improperly. And so Correct. and so I think they're just mad because making a murderer made people look. That's what it, they're it, mad about. It did. But the uh, the the other thing of course is um there's an anti-Netflix movement too. 
because if you have a look on Netflix, there are so many um, programs, shows, documentary about uh, innocent people being incarcerated and then being exonerated. So it makes law enforcement and the whole procedure look really, really bad, right? And we've actually done a lot of podcasts on some of those cases. So Netflix seems to be like court TV, but they do these docu-series and it, and it puts the, the pressure and the spotlight on the entire process that puts the heat on them and they hate it. Checking convictions. Yeah. Um, Netflix is like the on uh, the worldwide innocent project. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, they, they, yeah. are, they show they show a lot. I mean, there has been so much since making a murder. In fact, I'm going to plug one that's just released. It's called The Phantom. And it is about a death row case in, uh, I believe it's Texas. Yes. Um, that was, uh, he was innocent. They found this out afterwards. And the only reason why they even checked it out is because George Bush, or one of, you know, the son was a governor there, I think he was. And yes. uh, he said no one died on that wasn't guilty under my watch. So they checked it out and they found out. And this and this story is mind boggling because this guy sounds like he's making all this stuff up and it all turns out to be very true. So it's, yeah. it, I recommend watching that. But yes, the the exactly what you said. They're they're against anything that's going to make somebody take a look at it. Christina, I think you were the one that said that. That's what they were mad about. They were mad because people yes. looked into it. For once, because I, for one, which I've talked to many people, have never known about the, all this corruption going on and wrongful convictions. I was shocked, and I get shocked yeah. all the time. So, yes. Yeah. Yep. Hundred percent. Hundred percent agree. Uh, Sunshine, Christina. I think it. We need to be clear here. Documentaries about wrongful convictions have been out for many years. Think back to. I think it's called Innocence Lost. Yeah, oh, yeah. From the West Memphis Three. Yeah, I yeah. think the problem that those who don't want a light, a spotlight shown on them, is that Netflix is able to reach the world, and so oh, yeah. it sparks yes. a conversation yes. with so many people. And I was, I made a comment about this on Reddit last night. Even though, I mean, Netflix has a gazillion titles and, I mean, lots of different subjects are covered. But because there is such a large interest in wrongful convictions, we know that there has to be a team of individuals employed by Netflix that looks for, for product to feature on their, on their platform. Correct. So, so Colbert and Griesbach, by, by not thinking, have chosen to sue a company that has the money to pay for attorneys who have yes. gone to the best law schools. And they're going to now have to look at this case in depth to see if it is truthfully or if it is in reality a wrongful conviction. So they have now introduced even more people to look into what has been done in order yeah. to defend their client. So it's a really foolish endeavor to try and prove that, uh, you know, that he was slandered when going up against a company who can uh, and pay to hire someone to to defend them like if you read that it's it's just i don't see how they even think they're gonna win I correct mean, correct it's crazy and the the irony is there could be ma'am the offshoot <laughs> they may do a side project all on colburn now wouldn't that be interesting right so it defeats the purpose that's what it's i'm trying to get at I mean, yeah, I mean, they may have just given us another season three on how to defend. Yourself. Oh yeah, 
against Correct. being wrongly accused of of showcasing wrongful convictions. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alice, do you have a comment? Yeah, they're, they're just bot hurt. They are seriously bot hurt because they've been caught. That, that is it. It's, it's not the fact that um, he was proven um, or it looks like he was shown in a bad light or anything like that. Even with us doing our research after the documentary and everything like that, every single one of the cops in that man of talk are all in a bad light. It's just that these two, especially Colburn and that, made themselves look stupid. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And the mere fact that they also didn't write a lot of reports meant that you're getting second-hand information from others, right? Yeah. And, Col and Colburn had the habit of writing a report years down the track. Yeah. Right? It was eight years okay. or something, was it not, after the fact that he wrote the report yeah, about the correct. phone call? That's correct. That's yeah. correct. So I think it's just the fact that they're, they're butt hurt because they've been, they're, they've been caught out. Their corruption and everything like that has been brought to the light of day and they don't want their people in their community, the ones that had the respect for them and everything like that, to find yes. out just how shady they actually are and that it's been gone on for years and years and years and years. And now it's finally came to light and they don't like that fact. So they try to quash it and they're trying to sue Netflix so as that they can still look like they're the good ones in this, you know, because if Colburn sues Netflix for defamation and everything like that, um, then that's him proving, to, trying to prove to himself and everybody else around about them that what um, what was in Netflix, in Mam was a load of rubbish. But that isn't true because you go back on the documents and the documents and yes. statements and everything like that, and you can Correct. clearly see where it is. You know what I mean? And they don't like the fact that there is people out there now that has looked into this case as much as they had because they thought it was going to just get convicted and swept under the rug and nobody else was going to pay any more attention and Stephen and Brendan are in jail for the rest of their lives. And that's Correct. how they wanted it. But because of the, the sleuths, um, the armchair sleuths have been looking into it and found all this stuff, they don't like it one bit. No, no. And you must admit, all the foyers that are being requested, that's got to ring alarm bells. That's got to ring alarm bells. They must be thinking, jeepers, why do people want all this stuff? Yeah. And a lot of people are foying information. Very, very interesting. Thank you yeah, so much. But, sorry, yes. Doc, but the fact sorry. that um, Weegar or Liger is the one that's in charge yes. of saying who gets these foyers is yes. ridiculous. It should be taken right out of his hands and done by somebody else to deal with these foyers because he's not going to hand out stuff left, right and centre if it's going to prove him in a bad light or his no. officers in a bad light, you know? Correct. So uh, Correct. in my opinion, it shouldn't even go through Liger because he can say, nah, you're not <laughs> getting it, even if they've got it, you know what I mean? They can turn around and tell us, nah, we've not got that, and it's sitting in his office safe, you know what I mean? That's correct. And all he'll say is, oh, the document is sealed and yeah. we can't, can't give it to you because it's part of an impending investigation. So, therefore, a Uyghur is the gatekeeper of what goes out. Yeah. Or they're like Jack says, they're charging you £5,000 because it's going to take a few hours for somebody to get off their arse and go and have a look for some documents and everything like that because they're not in the right places. It's bloody ridiculous. Yep. 100% agree. Thank you very much, Alice. A chicken convictions. Yeah, um, TT um, Fangirl says, aren't we censored enough in the likes of Apple, Facebook, and more? If they take freedom of speech and creative and creative um, documentaries on Netflix, I'm moving to an island in the Pacific. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, look, 
uh, to be honest, I don't know how long Netflix can continue in this vein because it's really pissing off a lot of people, especially law enforcement. And, you know, you can imagine that they would have four or five documentaries in the pipeline because it takes a long time to do these documentaries. Now, if you saw the documentary, this wasn't on Netflix, on Robert Durst, I think it was six parts on Robert Durst. Unbelievable what came out of that documentary, how he actually confessed to the murders because he didn't realise his microphone was turned on, right? And so, you know, this this only happens with very good investigative journalism. You have to be meticulous to find all this information out. Sunshine Christina. Back to the reports, um, I just want to make sure that everyone recognizes that all of these reports were written days, weeks, and months later without benefit of audio to refresh the investigator's memory. And we, we just, we don't know, we have very little accounting of a day's activities from that day. It's all scripted. And then if you look at page 278 in the queso, it clearly states there that from that point forward, and I think this was like mid-December, all reports written were actually not even written by an investigator. They were transcribed by yet another person. So it's like third-hand information, you know, Correct. filtered by bias. Correct. Well, we know, we know what the issue is. The issue was to stop those depositions from Vogel and Kaserik. And that's why they had to act in haste. Everything was done at supersonic speed. It wasn't done like a proper investigation because the ulterior motive was to stop the civil suit, limit the damage. Uh, Jack 61. Oh, uh, Jack sorry, so, oh so, sorry, sorry, Doc. I, I didn't mean to have be unmuted. I don't know why I no, did that. No hassles, no hassles. Well, look, guys, I promised that we're only going to go for an hour. And uh, sorry, Bibi, but <laughs> I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh at you this morning. Normally, I laugh at you when you say that, such silly things. That's correct. That's correct. We've done over two hours. And I am conscious of the time because it's quite late here in uh, in Adelaide. But look, guys, I'd like to thank my panel for excellent discussion. We Look, we could have talked for another four or five hours easy on the bones and the cremains and everything like that. But it was very interesting, this chapter um, on Lincoln Colburn. It was pretty clear that Ken Kratz was defending them, defending their honour. Uh, and he was very, very upset with the defence team for even suggesting that they were involved in planting uh, blood, in planting the key and other pieces of forensic evidence. Although, if you read the trial transcripts, uh, especially Colburn, he made himself look really silly and very guilty himself. No one else did it himself. i also like to thank... Um, everyone in, in chat for coming along and listening to us um, go on for a couple of hours. We hope that you've enjoyed the show. If you like the podcast, guys, please subscribe. Uh, leave your DNA on the thumbs up. Give us any suggestions. And as we normally do, um, what I like to do is to go through the list, just say a couple of words, how you're going, uh, and, and things like that. Alice. How about yourself? How are you going? Yeah, all good, Doc. All good. Um, might go live later. Um, not 100% sure on that yet. Still got a few bits and bobs to do um, to get my slides uh, done. But I'm going to start with the, the agreed facts, the actual agreed facts of Luke's case. Um, yes. And then from there, I'm going to show just how much the story's changed um, statements were changed, uh, things like that, and phone calls and 
everything like that so uh hopefully i'll have that finished soon and i'll be able to go live with it but i'll uh, put a notice out and let everybody know when that's going to happen awesome and uh, are you feeling nice and relaxed after venting uh, uh, i'll eat that <laughs> <laughs> no no worries thank you very much alice a uh, bb i'm good i'm the same everything's good um alice plug your channel It's Alice in Wrongful Conviction Land um, on YouTube. Um, I hope to see you there. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Um, checking convictions. What about yourself? Um, well, I got inspired for a really good podcast. I think I wanted to <laughs> from this <laughs> today. So that's one thing that's, that's new in the brain. But I'd also like to mention that it is Wrongful Conviction Day today. So. Um, everybody you know um think about the wrongful conviction yes we're doing the right thing right i mean we're we're talking about it so yes yeah, we get are the word out. get the word out yes we are thank you very much checking convictions uh inexplicable susan yeah just busy downsizing and getting ready to move so oh uh, i'm all focused on that pretty much this week so Awesome. Are you moving? Are you moving very far from where you live now? Oh, about ten miles. You're not going to Wisconsin, eh? <laughs> never, <laughs> <laughs> never, never. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much, inexplicable Susan. Thank Thanks, you. Uh, Jack sixty one. Uh, still working on some uh, foils. Got some things in the pipeline. Um, working on more calls. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Just just keep pounding the pavement. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And thank you for getting those calls. Um, and and Sunshine Christina for some foyers as well. Awesome job, Sunshine Christina. Well, Jax is being modest. Um, he we received recently a thumb drive with. Uh, emails to Larry Ledvina from uh, discussing Teresa Havoc, Stephen Avery, Brendan Nassie, or Making a Murderer. Um, and Jax, I'm going to let Jax talk a little bit more about it. Um, I don't think what's on the, what's on the zip, on the, let me just let him talk about it because I am not the computer gifted one. Um, <laughs> but it's very interesting info. So, Jax, if you want to expound on that. Basically, this thumb drive, when I first looked at it, uh, when I got it, it really looked like the program that I was using. It looked like emails that we already had. Some of these, a lot of these third party, a third party lawyer that was working for Calumet in conjunction with um, the DOJ when they were, this is early 2016, when they didn't want to release any, or there were concerns about breaking seals on evidence tape and all that. Yes. And I, yes. And I thought that was all was on there, uh, according to this program that I was using. But I was irritated because the flash drive itself has, uh, you know, 50 or 60 megs of, of data on it. And I knew that was not enough. So later on in the afternoon, I just happened to pop it in this file into a browser that could read this particular file type. And bam, the, here sits this folder. It says deleted mail. And within no. that uh, within that folder, there are literally hundreds of emails, and it's not only to Larry to and from Larry Ledvina. There are others too. So, so oh, I got an I got another program, um, and I've, I'm about and I'm probably not even halfway through um, the stuff from uh, surrounding Larry. Uh, a lot of these files have attachments with them that I can download. So I'm going yes. through it. I'm just I'm going through it, and you know. And trying to uh, keep everything as organized as possible. We'll see what we end up with. Uh, it's probably, I would imagine Open some of these life. things. Yeah, Open probably. Life, yeah, probably. Um, it, it's really interesting, you know, uh, surrounding uh, right after uh, end of uh, December 2015, early 2016, the these networks that were after files on people, and not mm -hmm. only, you know, not only uh, Stephen and and Brendan and other, but emails from 
people within these departments. They wanted access to all that, and it's just it's crazy. So well, Jack sixty one. Sunshine, yeah. Christina. I think we got about another ten open mics there oh for a start. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Zoe, how about yourself? Um, no, nothing. All <laughs> the same. I have nothing to say. Just it's enjoying listening you know to listening to you guys. What did you say? I said you're enjoying cracking the whip, right, boss? Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> just bread and oh, water. Just bread. Just, just bread and water over here is all I got to say. That's it. What? That's what are you saying, guys? She's a tough, tough, terrible boss. Hey, you're, <laughs> you're the best boss. Who are you you're the boss talking keeping about? Keeping us in line. You're the boss keeping us in line. <laughs> oh boy, I need to get better. I think. <laughs> yeah, see, you've been off your game there. Correct. Yeah. Glad you're feeling better, though. I am feeling better. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Zoe. Thank you no for problem. that. And I hope, hope that you get better soon. Uh, I will. Yeah, thank you. Sammy. I'm doing quite well. I'm getting ready for bed. How are you? <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm getting ready for bed as well. Uh, not too bad. Thank you. Um, doing the best I can. Um, I've been doing uh, a lot of reading and research and, uh, yeah, just finding all these gold nuggets absolutely everywhere. So it'll be very interesting next week, guys, because uh, next week the chapter is on none other than Ken Kratz himself, the prize. But we'll we'll keep that for next week. Um, so, guys, um, again, I'd like to thank the team, the panel, our listeners. Thank you so much for uh, listening in and subscribing. And we will all catch you next week, hopefully. Thank you. This has been a File Play production.